Initiative project and is not endorsed by the Department of Defense or any military component. The views expressed are those of the host. The content of this podcast is not meant to be legal or medical advice. Warning, this episode contains graphic details of murder and is not suitable for young listeners. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome back, True Crime Army. I am your host, Margo, and this is a true crime podcast where I focus on crimes committed by military members and veterans. But don't worry, you don't have to know anything about the military to listen, I promise. You just have to be a true crime enthusiast. And if that's you, welcome home. So I haven't really mentioned it a lot, but if you're not already a member of the Military Murder Facebook discussion group, you need to head over to facebook.com slash groups slash military true crime to join the discussion now. And in case you're wondering, it's free. Um, The other day I hadn't logged on for a few days and there were all these articles about military folks committing crimes, about suspicious deaths and the whole nine yards. Also, many of you have taken to sending me articles about these current cases, but I encourage you to put the links on the Facebook discussion group. In case you missed it, there are thousands of us out there interested in this particular topic. So go check it out today, facebook.com slash groups slash military true crime. But let's get on with today's show. Today's case is so dramatic in the gut-wrenching kind of way that after it was all said and done, Hollywood decided they needed to get their hands on this story to tell it to the world. And this wasn't a B-rated movie either. No, no, no. It had the likes of Tommy Lee Jones, Susan Sarandon, and Charlize Theron play the leads. It's a movie called In the Valley of Ela. Join me today as I discuss the story of specialist Richard Davis, his disappearance, and what happened after he failed to report to work for four whole months. Now, let's dig in. My main sources for this episode include an article titled Death and Dishonor by Mark Boll a 48-hour special titled Duty, Death, Dishonor, and an article written in the British news source, The Independent. I also watched the movie In the Valley of Ela, which is a fictional depiction of what occurred in this case. And I read various Georgia appellate decisions regarding this case. 9-11 was one of those life moments that changed the world. And anyone in the military at the time can tell you that for those who served before 9-11, and those who served after 9-11, life was very different. One such person serving before and after 9-11 was 25-year-old Specialist Richard Davis. He was a military brat. Both his mom and dad served in the military. And so early on, he knew he wanted to follow in the family tradition. The military was all he knew, and it was all he'd ever know. Richard was born in Germany on March 14, 1978, to Lonnie and Remy. His dad, Lonnie, had spent most of his military career as a military police officer, and Remy, his mom, was a medic. Born and raised everywhere, as most military brats are, Richard lived in Kansas, California, and finally settled in Missouri. Sadly, Richard was bullied most of his life because he was different. And when I say different, I mean different from the Midwesterners who he settled near. You see, Richard was Filipino-American, so he got a lot of slack because he looked quote, different. In 1999, Richard joined the army and he served his first tour working in artillery. And after returning home and attempting to make it in the civilian sector, he realized, "Eh, you know what? I was made to be in the army. So he re-upped and joined an infantry unit. At this point, he was stationed at Fort Benning. Fort Benning is located in Columbus, Georgia, And I think I've mentioned this before, but many military installations are kind of in the middle of nowhere, right? They need a lot of space to do their military thing. And Columbus, I hear, is no different. Richard was a member of the B Company, 1st Battalion, 15th Infantry Regiment, 3rd Brigade, 3rd Infantry Division, Mechanized. And our story begins on July 12th, 2003. There were five men, Richard, Jacob Bergone, Mario Navarrete, Douglas Woodcoff, and Alberto Martinez. These five were fresh back from a tour in Iraq. And when I say fresh off the deployment, I mean it. They were still on their two-day R&R, which stands for rest and relaxation, 
from touching down on American soil. And these two days, it's the time given to allow folks to kind of gather their bearings and get the edge off. The night before the men were to return to work, they decided to take the edge off by visiting the local Hooters. They wanted some beer. They wanted some wings. And after they were there for a couple hours, they headed to the local strip club because they wanted some ladies, ladies, ladies. The strip club was called the Platinum Club. It was nestled on the same street as a gas station and a Waffle House. Super classy. They all seemed to be having a good time, but Richard seemed to really have a hard time handling his alcohol, which is not surprising considered he probably hadn't drank in forever. And, you know, the same can be said for the other four gentlemen, because at this point, the bouncer was like, hey, boys, your buddy here, he looks like he's had enough. According to the 48 Hours episode, Alberto and Douglas walked Richard out of the club. They took him to the car to sleep it off, and then they went back inside, where they were smoking and joking, watching girls, and playing pool. They were inside for about another hour or so, and then they just up and left. It appears that they may have also gotten a little bit rowdy and maybe they were kicked out, but it's really unclear. With their pride hurt and blaming Richard over whose fault it was that they had even been kicked out to begin with, Jacob went after Richard. It's unclear if Jacob took Richard out of the car and threw him a beating or if he just slapped him around while he was in the car. All we know by Jacob's own accord is that Richard didn't even fight back. Then the men allegedly all jumped into the car and returned to Fort Benning. When it comes to vitamins, we all deserve to be a little bit of a skeptic. And if you are, that's a good thing, especially when it comes to vitamins, which is why I choose to take the Ritual Essential for Women 18 Plus multivitamin. Ritual created a clinically backed multivitamin for women who are 18 and over. Ritual's multivitamin supports brain health, bone health, blood health, and provides antioxidant support. And above all else, Ritual has traceable key ingredients in clean bioavailable forms. I've always, or almost always, been a vitamin consumer, but I never liked the taste, chalky and honestly just nasty. I often wondered what all those ingredients even meant on the label, but I figured, hey, I needed the vitamins, so I just put up with the horrid taste and the ingredients I couldn't even pronounce. But that is now an issue of the past, ever since I found Ritual. Because Ritual comes packed with nine key nutrients in two capsules per day. So you can take your vitamins and relax knowing that you are in good hands. Another thing is that Ritual is packaged in a minty capsule that will leave you feeling refreshed. I've been using Ritual Essential for Women for two months now and I couldn't be happier. So listen up, no more shady business. Ritual's Essential for Women 18 Plus is a multivitamin you can actually trust. And right now, Ritual is offering my listeners 10% off during your first three months. Visit ritual.com slash military10 to start Ritual or to add Essential for Women 18 Plus to your subscription today. Prior to this night, the group of five had been deployed to Iraq. But this was not Richard's first deployment. He had actually deployed once before to Bosnia. In 1999, he manned a 50-caliber machine gun, but he complained that he never got to see any action. He was sure, though, that he'd one day see war. He wanted to share his own war stories with his dad, a Vietnam veteran that, you know, this guy had tons of war stories, and Richard wanted to match his dad. And if war is what he wanted, war is what he got. In April of 2003, Richard and his crew were in Iraq, and they found themselves in Ambush Alley. This was an area that connected people to the airport, and it was just about guaranteed to be a spicy ride due to all of the snipers perched above the buildings. On April 11th, as the B Company drove through Ambush Alley, they encountered an enemy that would not let up. This engagement, later dubbed the Midtown Massacre, lasted about five hours. It all began, as described by Mark Bull in his article, when one of the troops spotted a sniper and took the sniper and the entire building out. Then, after a minute of silence, all hell broke loose. After a squad of six unmounted, a suicide bomber came near, detonating himself and hitting a captain with shrapnel. And this is when the scenario became real. It was kill or be killed. Every detainee at that point going forward was treated as a suicide bomber. And some, or at least one, was even allegedly executed by the battlefield colonel. 
Allegedly, 100 Iraqis died during this encounter. Only four Iraqi prisoners of war survived. Two of the survivors were in Richard's care. And after this, things were pretty hot for B Company. They had to go door to door at one point looking for weapons cache. They had to guard a highly flammable area, which wasn't extremely easy, considering that one bullet would explode the whole thing. Apparently, it wasn't all bad as the B Company got to raid a few of Saddam Hussein's properties. And Saddam was living an extremely extravagant life. They found AK-47, swords, a silver box, and even a gold toilet. In early May, Richard called his dad and they spoke about the future. Richard was super excited to get back home so that he could work on his car. But the excitement of returning home quickly turned into despair when without real reason, Richard called his dad out of the blue and asked him to get him out of Iraq. According to the documentary on 48 Hours, Richard confided in his dad that he didn't have a safe place to lay his head and he was tired of looking out for himself. Lonnie was a little bit shocked and he wasn't quite sure what to make of the situation. He felt his son just needed help with some of the things that he saw, but Lonnie didn't think it was anything they couldn't work on when he returned to the U.S. Eventually, in early July, the B Company guys were in Kuwait, finally heading home, hoping to catch a flight. Many civilians don't know this, but deployment dates are kind of smushy. You never know when you're actually going or coming, and that's probably for operational security purposes. But that means that for those of us who have to live it, there's a lot of uncertainty. In any event, the guys get back to Kuwait, and it appears that their reputations have preceded them. And everyone thought the members of B Company were, get this, they thought that they were all rapists and murderers. And while they were in Kuwait, instead of relaxation, the soldiers were met with tight living quarters, extremely hot temperatures, think Kuwait in July, and they were still living with the images etched into their brains that caused a lot of aggression. And they turned to each other to get the aggression out by fighting. During one particular fight, Richard sliced his hand open, or maybe it was sliced open. Richard told his friend, the medic, not to tell anyone, but he told the medic that it was caused by Mario and Alberto. And Richard also said that the soldiers beat up on him. There was an incident reported by the Independent where Mario and Alberto tried to choke Richard to death. But I'm not sure if this was this incident. In any event, when interviewed by investigators about the open hand wound, Richard lied and said it was a gang related ritual. And apparently investigators didn't ask any questions, which baffles me a little bit because nowadays I feel like that would have been squashed right away and the other guys would have been in trouble if they were determined to actually be gang members. But, you know, I guess times are different. And also, I don't know, I'm the type of person that I expect that people will actually be doing their jobs. On July 16th, 2003, Richard's dad was resting up in his home in Charles, Missouri. Richard's dad, Lonnie Davis, was a retired army staff sergeant, so he knew what military life was like. On this day, July 16th, he was awakened by his phone ringing, and when he answered, he was informed that his son Richard was AWOL, which stands for absent without leave. He had never reported back to his unit after his two days of R&R. &R. &R. And if your spidey senses are going up, you just wait and never doubt your gut. Lonnie was like, nah, man, not my son. He's not the AWOL type. Something's up. But back at the unit, the B Company first sergeant was pretty sure that Richard had just shacked up with some girl. He had partied in excess and he'd be back soon. But Lonnie knew something was wrong. Maybe it was father's intuition or maybe it was the career that he spent as a military police officer. Lonnie hung up the phone, not thinking much of it. He attempted to call his son and left the voicemail. But after not hearing from Richard for several days and then weeks, he decided he needed to go down to Fort Benning and figure it out. And off he went. It was August 19th, 2003. But before then and after then, Lonnie spent weeks getting the runaround. I mean, Lonnie loved the military, but his fear in what was happening was beginning to make him lose all hope in the machine that he encouraged his son to join. There was one particular issue that we've all heard all too often, especially recently. Richard was listed as AWOL. Lonnie wanted his status to be changed to missing because no one goes out searching for soldiers who went AWOL or who go AWOL. 
Lonnie put his detective hat on and off he went to talk and interview everyone. And he heard that Richard didn't like to hang out, so no one really knew anything about him. And this kind of shocked Lonnie a little bit because he told Mark Bowl that he knew it was a crock of poo because if his son was actually such a loner, then at least he'd be known as the loner. He knew they didn't want him snooping around and the soldiers weren't talking. But Lonnie didn't give a crap. Lonnie tried to go see Richard's barracks to see if they could, you know, be any indication of his whereabouts, but he wasn't allowed to do that either. Lonnie was helpless. So he went to the Columbus Police Department, hoping, pleading that they would be able to help. But in an almost comical way, they laughed in his face. Military handles their own cases. So if he's missing, tell the army, they said. But Lonnie already did that. And I am sure that Lonnie wanted to reach over the counter and shake the crap out of the employee. But he held it together. Lonnie was so desperate at this point. Then on September 8th, 20 or so days after he arrived at Fort Benning, he asked his congressman for help. And it was this act of despair that finally dislodged the army. The congressman, Kenny Holshoff, got in contact with the Secretary of Defense, Donald Rumsfeld, about the missing soldier at Fort Benning. And an inquiry was launched on September 16th. That was two whole months after Richard had last been seen. It was at this point that the army decided to call in Richard's comrades to find out if they knew where he might be. Two and a half freaking months. Can you imagine if you go missing and no one starts to look for you until 75 days later? But by this point, if anyone knew anything, they weren't going to talk. And just when investigators were about to throw in the towel, like told you, Sarge, ain't nothing here. A rumor would blow this case wide open open. Have you ever wondered what it would be like to have a therapist, someone that you could talk to in a judgment-free zone? Maybe you have thought about it, but you were scared away by the thought of taking the first step, or maybe you thought therapy wasn't affordable. Try Talkspace. By doing virtual therapy, Talkspace has made getting people help easy, accessible, and affordable. Y'all don't know this, but some things in my life recently have really gotten me down. I wasn't quite sure how to get out of the funk. I wasn't sure how to get back up. So I figured I would try therapy because I was sure that it would definitely not make things any worse. And I'm so glad that I tried it. I have found new coping mechanisms to deal with stress and I'm now looking forward to my future. Talkspace makes it easy to find a therapist that you like and it's so convenient to do everything from the comfort of wherever you are, because life sometimes gets hectic. Sometimes I take my calls in my office. Sometimes I take my calls in the car. Life is mobile and therapy should be too. At Talkspace.com, you can sign up online and get a personalized match with a provider that's right for you. And it's typically done within 48 hours. Talkspace is the number one online therapy platform with licensed therapists in over 40 specialties, including anxiety, depression, relationship issues, and much more. And right now, as a listener of this show, you'll get $100 off your first month with Talkspace when you go to Talkspace.com slash military murder. To match with a licensed therapist today, visit Talkspace.com slash military murder to get $100 off your first month and to show your support for the show. That's Talkspace.com slash military murder. For weeks since Richard disappeared, there were rumors that four soldiers, Jacob, Mario, Alberto, and Douglas, had left Richard in the woods near the 4400 block of Milgan Road, near a gun shop. So the detectives, you know, they heard this and they were intrigued. This wasn't a case where they were getting tons of leads, and this one in particular seemed promising. So on November 7th, 2003, they checked it out. And when they arrived near the wooded area near the gun shop, they couldn't believe their eyes. They started to see bones. And that's when they kept walking and they found a human skull. It looked as though the person had been burned. The body was only identified later using dental records and it was Richard Davis. And since the body was so badly decomposed on top of the fact that it had been burned, the coroner didn't actually know what caused Richard's death. 
But what they did know was that he was stabbed at minimum, at minimum, 32 to 33 times because those were the stabs that penetrated all the way to the bone on his head, neck, and torso. One of the stab wounds to the head penetrated all the way to Richard's skull. Counting backwards, the investigators realized that Richard had likely been laying there in the brush for four months. They theorized that he was burned, but his body was intact, and it was after the several months in the elements that wildlife had begun to mess with his corpse, which is why there were bones scattered everywhere. Immediately, they realized the rumor was now true. So they brought in the four rumored people to have last seen Richard, his friends from the club. But let's not forget, not just his friends from the club, his deployed brothers who had just returned home with him. And when detectives brought him in, some of them lawyered up. Some of them were like, me? What? Murder? No way. But one of them sang like a canary. It seems that the story takes us right up to that moment in the parking lot when Jacob was beating up on Richard. The five of them then pile into one car and drive off. Jacob continues to beat up on Richard in the car. And unbeknownst to Jacob or Richard, allegedly, Alberto drives them to a kind of remote area and everyone gets out. But it's unclear why, 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 why did they drive to this area and did they all get out? It was the secluded location near the gun shop. Jacob was heated from the fight. So he's like, yeah, yeah, let's do this. And it was Jacob and Richard. But it wasn't a fair fight because according to Jacob, he was beating up on Richard and Richard didn't fight back. He just covered his face and told him, leave me alone, leave me alone. And while a sober Richard would have defended himself, Richard was wasted and he had just woken up from a drunken stupor. At this point, Mario started throwing hands. Then, without provocation, one of the men who wasn't even involved in this particular fight, Alberto, the driver, he takes out a knife and drives it right into Richard's side. Everyone was shocked. The stab stops Richard in his track as he collapses. All the while, the blood was oozing out of him from the wound. No one will ever know really what happened next, except for the four men at the scene who left with their lives. According to Jacob, he pleads to Alberto, please, 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 that they should take Richard to the hospital. But instead of listening, Alberto continues stabbing Richard. When Alberto failed to listen, Jacob gave up all hope for Richard. Then Mario's like, well, what? Come on, come on. I I think we can still save him. But Jacob wouldn't let him by. Mario allegedly kept saying, what are you doing, man? Talking to Alberto. Let's take him to the hospital. We can save him. But Alberto was like, no dice. If we do, he'll report us and we'll all get in trouble. Oh, and this mentality always, always shocks me because I'm like, OK, but assault with a deadly weapon is still less than murder. And also bringing the guy to get help plays well in your favor at sentencing. So come on, man. But nope. The logical sense doesn't work for these folks. And when their pleas go unanswered, Jacob and Mario just sit back and let Alberto brutally kill their comrade. But you're probably wondering, what about the fourth member? Wasn't there five guys total? Where was he? Well, by all accounts, Douglas never got close enough to this incident. He wanted nothing to do with the original fight and he just kind of wandered off. Jacob describes a scene as a madman on a rampage. Jacob said that when Alberto looked at him, there was red in his eyes. He, meaning Alberto, just wanted to kill. Alberto was just going to town, stab after stab, blow after blow. But not even just that. Jacob told 48 Hours that Alberto would stick Richard with the knife and then churn the blade, taking his sweet time. After Alberto had stabbed Richard at minimum 33 times, The three men involved pulled Richard deep into the woods while they figured out how to dispose of a body. And guess where they went? Nope, not Home Depot or Lowe's. They went to a convenience store to buy lighter fluid and matches to set the corpse on fire. What in the actual hell? I still think it's insane that people think it's easy to dispose of a body with fire. But anyway, maybe that's because I watched too much true crime. When the guys returned to the scene of the brutal attack, it was clear Richard was dead. 
So they poured the lighter fluid and Jacob lit the match, Richard's body burning in flames. And the men just watched as if they were having a bonfire. Then, as if they had watched one too many true crime shows, Jacob realized that car tires are like fingerprints. So they voted to change the tires on the car and they washed the inside to remove any signs of Richard. But it wouldn't end there. A few days later, they returned to where Richard's body was. They were there with the intent to bury the body, but the ground was too hard. So they just left. Sadly, Jacob had actually revealed Richard's whereabouts to another army buddy long before they found his remains. It appears that what happened that July night bothered him and he finally had to come clean. So one day in a drunken conversation with a friend, Jacob blurted out, quote, I know who did it to Davis. I know who killed him. I was there, end quote. What? While the friend didn't come forward, it was too juicy a story to not spread it like wildfire. And that's when the rumor got into the detective's hands. And thankfully so. But why? The story that three of the four perpetrators gave, because Douglas never spoke, didn't reveal why in the actual hell they would brutally murder a fellow soldier they just fought side by side with in Iraq. Lonnie, Richard's dad, theorized that while the beginning of the night may have started out fine, something clicked in the four guys' heads in the strip club parking lot. And when they all got into the car, they knew they were going to kill Richard. And then an anonymous person comes forward and reveals on a memorial page dedicated to Richard that the soldiers killed Richard because Richard had information that some soldiers raped a young girl in Iraq and he was planning to come forward. But these theories were always just speculation. But according to 48 Hours, the army did launch an investigation into this allegation of an Iraqi girl being raped but that allegation was never substantiated. However, they did discover that some soldiers paid for sex with Iraqi women. Hmm, I don't know about that. So who were these guys? Now, I wasn't able to find a ton of information on the perpetrators, but here is what I did find. Jacob. Jacob was a real all-American boy, born in Tallahassee, Florida, He joined the army at 18 years old because he liked the fast pace of it. He was happy to represent the flag, his people, and the corps. One of Jacob's hobbies was sparring or boxing on his spare time. And on one occasion, according to Mark Bowles' reporting, Jacob punched another soldier so hard that the other guy fell into a coma. And Jacob was built like a boxer. He was six foot tall and he had a broad chest and broad shoulders. Now, I'm kind of imagining the Hulk, but, you know, less green. He was the one that everyone feared. And interestingly, right before they went on the deployment, while at a strip club with Richard, they got into a fight and Jacob allegedly hit Richard really, really hard. He was apparently Richard's bully. Jacob experienced a lot of mental health issues while overseas, but it all escalated on July 5th, 2003 when he attempted to commit suicide by overdosing on prescription drugs while they were in Kuwait. During his attempt, he was quickly sent to the U.S. for treatment where he revealed suicidal and homicidal ideations. And with that, he was separated from B Company. He would later be diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. Now, before any of you get all uppity with me, I'm not saying that everyone that has PTSD has homicidal or suicidal thoughts. But in this particular case, he told mental health providers about having homicidal and suicidal ideations, in addition to a slew of other symptoms that caused him to later be diagnosed with PTSD. And this is all what I read. This is not any opinion of my own. Jacob, it appears, couldn't get over the fact that he had killed people while he was deployed. According to The Independent, a British news source, Jacob admitting to killing over 100 Iraqis, including women, children, older men, soldiers, and civilians. Kuwait providers believe that, you know, this guy cannot be left unsupervised, nor should he be allowed near weapons. But when Jacob returned to the U.S., the treatment team at Fort Benning spoke to Jacob over the phone and decided, "Eh, you know, Jacob is fine. And they released him from being supervised. 
Sadly, Richard was murdered just a few days later. Jacob's own psychologist, John Stuart Curry, told 48 Hours that, quote, Jacob should have been hospitalized in a locked unit, end quote. When the rest of the guys returned, Jacob and Richard were sweetmates, so they both had their own bedrooms, but they did share a bathroom, and the arrangement, I guess, seemed to work. Mario was from San Juan, Texas, and he loved the army. He called it his family. He was a dismount on Bradley's, which are fighting vehicles. Douglas was from San Antonio, Texas. He joined the army after 9-11, and he knew that things would be popping off there soon. And, you know, he joined the army because he wanted in on the action. Alberto Martinez from Oceanside, California, was married and he had a child. And interestingly, at the time of the murder, he was actually getting ready to leave the military. According to a different soldier, Alberto was sort of lazy. He was also not trustworthy. And while he was in Iraq, he would tell people how he wanted to kill somebody. He really wanted to kill somebody. The four men were charged with murder, assault and battery and armed robbery. But the case wouldn't be an easy prosecution. So the prosecutors were seeking to make some plea deals. They believed Jacob's story. Remember, he was the first one to ever talk. But Douglas, the drunk wanderer who allegedly had nothing to do with the murder, was the first to raise his hand like me, 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 pick me, I'll take a plea deal. Mario, however, refused to take the plea deal. And Alberto was not even offered the plea deal because prosecutors believed that he was a knife wielding crazy who stabbed his comrade. Jacob then raised his hand and said, I'll do it. I'll take the deal. Now, the fact that Jacob got a deal only ignited Lonnie and many other people who believed that Jacob was the real culprit. But prosecutors have to take what they can get. And on January 23rd, 2006, Alberto and Mario stood trial. These were the two guys who didn't take the plea deals. By the way, I should have mentioned this earlier, but the guys were tried by civilians since the murder occurred off the installation. Well, during the trial, Douglas' testimony wasn't a nail in Alberto's coffin because he didn't actually see what happened, so he couldn't really testify to much. Jacob, however, takes a stand and he tells a story we already heard. But Alberto's attorney was like not playing, flipped the script and claimed that Jacob was the real killer. But Jacob ain't no punk. And he says, quote, I know who the killer is. I know who is involved. I know my part in it. I'm just as guilty. I'm guilty just like everyone up here is guilty. Everyone here is guilty. End quote. What? Can I say mic drop? And with that, the prosecution rested. In an interesting turn of events, Mario, a man who refused to take the plea deal, decided to take the stand in his own defense a move he would later regret. I mean, you know, sometimes this works, but sometimes it backfires. And it was like Cujo beating up on Paw Patrol up on the stand. Now, let's just say Mario claimed he didn't see a thing and people were not buying it. The jury doesn't take very long to deliberate and they return a guilty verdict. Both men were sentenced to life in prison. <laughs> As part of the plea deal, Douglas pled guilty to concealing a death and he was sentenced to five years of probation. As part of the plea deal, Jacob pled guilty to voluntary manslaughter. And during his sentencing hearing, Jacob felt Lonnie's wrath. Lonnie was a retired army soldier and he looked at Jacob and said, quote, you murdered my son. I don't forgive you. You're nothing but a cold blooded, dirty murderer. The Lord himself doesn't forgive people like you. Whatever demon you worship won't forgive you. There is not a name in this world that's bad enough for you. If I had my way, you wouldn't be sitting here right now. You're lucky I can't get my hands on you, end quote. And with that, Jacob was sentenced to 20 years in prison, the maximum allowed. I wanted to see where the felons were now, so I did a Georgia prison inquiry. And this is what I discovered. Mario is still listed as incarcerated and he was last serving at the Coffee Correctional Facility. Alberto is still incarcerated and he was last serving at Walker State Prison. And Jacob is still listed as incarcerated and he was last serving at Johnson State Prison. 
His maximum possible release date is November 7th, 2023. Richard was laid to rest in December of 2003, five months after he set foot on American soil after a grueling deployment. At his father's request, he was buried in a civilian cemetery because his father wanted nothing to do with the army after they lied to him and refused to look for his son for months. Lani refused to wear his own military uniform at the funeral, stating out of anger, quote, I should take it out and burn it, end quote. And he would mean it because later, he would learn that some parts of Richard's body were not buried with him because they had not been released to the family. When they were finally released to the family, Lonnie and Remy had a second funeral for Richard. There is more information out there about the psychology of war, what happens to the mind or what can happen to the mind when you're forced to stay in a hypervigilant state for prolonged periods of time. Our armed forces personnel who serve in war zones are expected to be in this state of awareness for months and sometimes even a year at a time. That type of discussion is so out of my league that I don't like to talk about it because I just don't feel like I could do it justice. But there is plenty of literature out there if that's a topic you want to continue to dig into. If you or anyone you know is having suicidal thoughts or just having a crisis, there are trained professionals who can help you 24-7. For the Suicide Prevention Line or the Military Crisis Hotline, the number is exactly the same. And if you're having an issue and you need to talk to someone, you can reach the hotline at 1-800-273-8255. There is an in-depth book about this case. And while I didn't read it, it has stellar reviews And I think if you want to keep digging, you should definitely check it out. It's by author Scylla McCain, and it's called Murder in Baker Company, How Four American Soldiers Killed One of Their Own. Hey, if you liked what you heard today and you want to support the show, there are so many ways that you can do it. First, you can start off by clicking subscribe wherever you're listening to the show right now. This way you never miss a new episode as soon as I drop it. You can also join the Patreon fan club. And by supporting the show on Patreon, you get access to ad-free episodes for as little as a dollar a month. And if you want more episodes, you get full bonus episodes starting at $5 a month. And listen, if you're not in a place to support the show monetarily, you can always just leave a review on Apple Podcasts, on Stitcher, using your computer, or you can leave a review on my Facebook page. Don't forget to follow me on social media on Instagram at Military Murder Podcast. And don't forget to join the Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash military true crime. I want to give a shout out to my new patrons, Jean, Regina G, Kelly P, and Mara V. This show was created by Mama Margot Productions and produced in collaboration with my newest assistant producer, Rebecca W. And executive producer for this episode was Falcon 13. The music was created by TyOps. Until next time, remember, you never really know what someone is capable of, so remain vigilant always. You have a fabulous week, and I'll keep digging to bring you another military murder story next week. (laughs) Shh, let's work another podcast.